AJ lost her voice. This is not good when you are a coach, a teacher, and a podcaster. Welcome to Beauty and the Gee, the podcast about jujitsu and so much more. I'm Jen Eads, a one stripe white belt. Whoa, let's take that, rewind it back. I'm Jen Eads, a one stripe blue belt full of curiosity and questions about all the things jujitsu. Now back to the show. I'm AJ Klingerman, a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt obsessed with Jiu Jitsu. And you do have your voice back. Somewhat. <laughs> and we have a guest. I'm Mish and I'm a white belt. I've been training with AJ since 21. Okay, so you're at a party and someone asks, what do you do? What do you say? For me, I say I'm a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu instructor. That's typically what I would answer. Mish, what would you say? I definitely tell them that I do jujitsu because it's something I actually like care about. And usually if I'm at a party, there's a bunch of other students. So, like we all know that we're students here. And so like maybe first I'll say, da, 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 I'm studying this and that. And then I'll like add on the jujitsu part because that's what I actually like. <laughs> nice. What do you say, Jen? Well, see, you're assuming that I've been to a party. <laughs> you, you have way more faith in my social skills than me. But like at a networking event or something, I will say I work in podcasting. Occasionally at a party, if it's more social, I may not necessarily even say anything about the podcasting because sometimes I'm there playing music or doing something like that. So that's what my identity is wrapped up in at that point. Still working on this voice thing. So just to kind of give a little recap of this voice. (laughs) I did. I lost it over three weeks ago. And it's better now, but it's very shaky. It's very in and out, um, very hard to project. (laughs) So, you know, they say not to clear your throat when you lose your voice. Really? Yeah. Why? I've never heard that. (laughs) It's just one of the things, like obviously so much research on it in the past three weeks, but um, it's just one of the things that they say can like damage your vocal cords. Interesting. You're not supposed to clear your voice or clear your throat. So how has that been for you? the last three weeks, not having much of a voice. Much more mentally traumatic than I expected. Really? Or would have thought. Um, But yeah, you know, like I typically teach a minimum of two hours a day, oftentimes four. And I haven't ever been silent, you know, like I haven't lost my voice to where it's complete silence. But it is, I do sound like a gremlin. (laughs) And it's really hard to talk. So I think that's one of the things, like it's not just mental, but it's physically exhausting to try and push enough air out to get my voice to Mm -hmm. people. Just weird, but that's what's happening. So mentally, how's that impacted you? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been, uh, you know, a little bit I've been catastrophizing, you know, Uh like, like, what if I don't get my voice back, you know, like, and so then I start the planning aspect. Okay. Well at camp, so I can be mic'd. That could be, you know, like that'd be okay. Cause can you imagine my current voice, uh, to 250 women? It, well, it could be camp. challenging. It could be challenging. You'd figure it out. Definitely. Um, and you know, like one of my main identities has always been, I don't need a microphone, right? I can talk to a room of 250 people and not need a mic. So loud and being able to project is also part of my identity along with being a coach. And we've got a tournament coming up in a couple of weeks and I'm typically the loudest coach there. You know, like I'm going to be annoying. I'm never going to shut up. I'm going to coach the whole time. And I don't know that that'll be possible. I don't know that I'll have enough voice back yet to do that. So like things like that are really hard. And so then that's how we kind of got talking about our identity. Like my identity is wrapped up in being a coach and being able to be loud and yell across the room. Like (laughs) I can't even, I'm like telling other people like, okay, tell them, you know, one more and then hit the line or like on the bell or, you know, (laughs) anything like that. I had said, I wish I had audio recordings of me saying these normal sayings that I say all the time through class so I could just like play it. (laughs) (laughs) Mish, how has your identity been wrapped up in jujitsu? 
So like ever since I started, I was like madly obsessed with it. I actually, I don't think this was like very clear to like my coaches in the beginning because actually in the beginning they thought I was gonna quit. And, but actually I like wanted to like train full time and I wanted to be like professional. That's how much I cared about it. And I kind of let go of that. But even when I did, um, I don't know, it was like a huge, huge part of my life. And I didn't realize so much so until I literally moved abroad and then I didn't do it anymore. And it kind of felt like a breakup and um because you were where did you go because you spent a whole semester you actually just got back oh yeah i was in copenhagen for a couple months i just got back from denmark and um it wasn't just because i was abroad i fully intended to train while i was there but i tore my knee over the summer and i tried to train when i got there but like it was getting worse so i decided to like stop it completely um just take a couple months off and like during those couple months i definitely felt lost i would best describe it as like a deconstruction and then the reconstruction of my identity and having to like figure that out and build it from kind of nothing in a completely new place, which was very nice. I think it was very much needed because like without jujitsu, I was like, I actually be like, who am I? And I had to remember like before the sport, I used to be something, but I wasn't actually sure what. So this is what you wrote your paper on? Yeah. Tell Did I tell me. you about it? Yeah. I've always been in interested in like the question of personal identity. And in philosophy, it's usually associated with the persistence problem, which is like the sameness of person over time. But rather than that, I'm more interested in the question of like who I am, like what makes me like me essentially. And um, so that's, yeah, that's what I was trying to talk about. And like something that's very, very interesting to me that I was trying to like account for in this paper is like the difference of who we are, like what we actually are, like whatever that may be, I call it like the essence and like what we do. And I describe that self-actualization or becoming is when like there's an alignment. It's like in accordance with each other. Because I believe that, I truly believe a lot of the times, a lot of the things we say or we do are like not, it, it doesn't match who we are. And like this can do, be due to like a lot of different things, particularly like our environment. There can be so many things in our environment that influence this, that like block certain opportunities, that influence our thought, our actions to where we can't really like become, as I say. So I think that's like very interesting. This like discrepancy that I'm very interested in. You know, like saying one thing and like doing something else. So what'd you figure out? <laughs> I figured out that actually, um, I've been thinking about this a lot more recently too, especially when I come back and I've been training and um, my knee is like getting worse these past few days. And I have to think about like, maybe I'll just quit again and I just keep thinking to myself that like, I'm actually nothing without this sport. So this is something I'm like still struggling with because I'm not entirely sure. And that's why it's been like, it's very depressing for me to think about what I would do without the sport. And I know it comes from like a hyper dependence on it. And I really didn't want to do that because like to the degree that I was like dependent on jujitsu, like before Copenhagen, it was, I loved it, but like it also ended up turning into like an avoidance mechanism you know it's like people say you come here and it's like therapeutic because like you let out your feelings or whatever but I feel like when I come in here I'm only so focused on the sport that I don't think about anything else and I just like avoid these other things in my life so it's like everything else in my life could be a literal a dumpster fire yeah a, a dumpster fire and like I'm just not thinking about it because I'm in the gym so often and so I don't have to but you know I don't think that's the way to go um so I think for me it's like finding a balance between that I think that's something that a lot of jujitsu people struggle with is finding the balance mm -hmm. of being a jujitsu person. Cause you know, like, I mean, I introduce myself still as obsessed with jujitsu. Yeah. Know? Like it's still a lot of what I do and like all the things I do, you know, like if you think about being a jujitsu coach or a business coach or a podcaster or, yeah. you know, anything like that, it's all, speaking and it's a lot of speaking yeah. so like even trying to rest my voice has felt impossible and I think a lot of people run into that from like the jujitsu standpoint you know like you get hurt and you can't roll or you can't drill and you're like what do I do with my life now <laughs> like who am I if I don't do jujitsu yeah and like the high level competitors I think they get very wrapped up in being a competitor, you know, mm -hmm. like it's tough. It can be very hard, you know, thinking that you're nothing without something or someone. I think I'm lucky because I came to it late. So I already had all of these other things. 
So I was like, it's never going to be my thing. Um, even though I love it and I love coming here, but it's not like my life would be over if I didn't have it because I have all of these other things. Yeah. Is there something that you can like correlate to that? You know, like if you couldn't do blank, I think if I couldn't play music, that would be really hard for me. Yeah. Um, because that I have done my entire life. So yeah, that would probably be my thing. Yeah. Like to your core, you're a musician. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I always identified as a dancer. Mm -hmm. Like dancing was who I was. And I remember a few years into my jujitsu journey and suddenly thinking, I don't identify as a dancer anymore. I identify as a jujitsu person. And that was wild for me because it was like just a, such a shift. And I was like, yeah. I, this has changed, you know? So I think an important lesson there is like, it doesn't have to be your identity for life. True. Well, and what I've noticed with a lot of people that do jujitsu, even the ones that compete at a high level, professionally, they are also at a very high level in, you know, whatever their life is outside of jujitsu too. Yeah. I think Emily Kwok is a great example of that. Totally. You know, like she's so profound and she does a lot of stuff outside of jujitsu. So like where we all identify her yeah. <laughs> as this amazing black belt and she has her own identity as lots of things, you know, like, and we all have lots of identities, right? Like, you know, maybe it's a spouse or parent or, you know, whatever that is. We also, we have a lot of identities. And for me, you know, like even talking about my prior relationship, I had done so much to build that other person. Yeah. That, you know, like when me said she felt like she was nothing without jujitsu, that's how I felt. I was like, I am nothing without this person because I don't matter if yeah. not for this person. And so like being able to build my own identity outside of that was very hard. How did you go about that? Therapy, 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 <laughs> therapy. Get therapy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'll go. I got one. I, I went to therapy. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like just realizing who I am and what I have to offer that is outside of that and being my own person. And really, that's why I started saying that, like, I felt like I was becoming a butterfly mm -hmm. was like I was going through that transformation of finding out who I really was. And that's still a work in progress. There are still multiple things where it's like, oh, do you like such and such? Like, do you like bacon? I'm like, I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't had bacon as an adult. I mean, I have now, but you know, like, <laughs> so I'm like, I don't actually don't know if I like bacon or not. So finding who my actual identity is has been fun and a challenge and wild to other people. <laughs> like, how do you not know if you like bacon? Well, you know, I think that's, I think it's just a learning process and having somebody that you can kind of talk that out with is helpful. Yeah. Mish, what does that look like for you? Because I think it's really interesting because, you know, I'm 51, AJ's in her 40s. You are, we'll just say much younger. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's a, great answer. that's a great answer. I mean, like, I'm still figuring it out, you know, like not to be redundant, but um, like, like figuring what out, like my identity, my life. Yeah, or, all of it. <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna be honest, I'm very still much confused. I don't think I'm a good person to ask. I feel like actually right now, this point in my life is a very um, turbulent, point it's fluctuating a lot there's a lot of uncertainty right now like before you graduate and um I don't really have a good plan but um with what AJ said about like your identity being like all tied up in one person I think this is like actually a very very common thing that we see a lot of the times in long-term relationships where it kind of turns into like a codependence and it's like you become so wrapped up in this person that you don't have your own like individual like thing and um I don't know I just I guess for me, I feel like I haven't had that just because I, not just because I haven't had like a long-term relationship, but also because I do think I'm like pretty independent at this point. So I don't think I could let it get to that point. And so I think not letting that happen first 
makes like figuring who you are like that much easier because rather than sifting through the noise of you and another person it's just like your own like mess you have to like sort through and like figure out and then when it's just you by yourself then it's like oh you can figure out like all these things you like dislikes what you actually care about and it's much more easier to like recognize i feel when you're like alone yeah for sure did you see the movie runaway bride Yes. Remember how she liked the eggs of whatever person she was with? Like that was one of the yeah. <laughs> themes that I felt like that was me. Like I didn't know what kind of eggs I liked. Oh my gosh. I had no idea. <laughs> it's just funny. Like those things that you, mm -hmm. you just absorb and you don't even recognize that you don't know who you are. Yeah. Is that because you internalize or always focus on like what your partner's like preferences for that was rather than your own? So you never like thought about like what you liked. It was just like. A hundred percent. Definitely. I mean, it was always, how do I please this person? And how do I, you know, like, I'll, I don't really care. I was, I lived by, I'd rather be in love than be right. So like in big things, it was more, I don't want to fight about it, but in little things, it was just like, well, I'm making these that it's just easier to make both. I never experienced what I, what I personally would want. So in essence, you were living for them. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, like that's, maybe a little bit of what I do now, you know, like as far as jujitsu, like as a coach, you kind of live for your students too, you mm -hmm. know, like you live for the community and building that. So, I mean, with losing my voice, there was definitely fear in like, does that mean my community crumbles? And it's such a silly thing, but you do, you catastrophize. You can't help but be like, what happens if it's not me? If it can't be me, do we still have this thing we've worked so hard to build and like I did say <laughs> I apologize to uh everyone that's hired me <laughs> but I mean I really I did say like I'm really glad that I've already been booked for all of these camps throughout this year because I fear that if somebody heard me now they wouldn't book me and as somebody who like wants to teach more and more at seminars and camps and stuff like that, like that's really hard. And so then you have to think about your goals differently and like, what do you want to do? I think 2020 is also a great example of that, yeah. right? Like we all set goals at the beginning of 2020 of what we wanted the year to look like. And then it, you know, hit Did the not brakes. Look that way. <laughs> exactly. And I think all of us since then have been kind of hesitant to be like setting big goals or anything. Yeah. It's like, I just want to I just want to be able to live my life. I want to be able to see my friends and my family and yeah. do jujitsu and, you know, like all these things that we took for granted. Mm -hmm. And your voice is definitely something that you take for granted. You think you can always communicate with it. And when suddenly you can't, or it's really hard to, or whatever, that's tough. Yeah. And the podcast, you know, like, mm -hmm. does my voice suck enough that people listen and go, ah, I'm just going to tune back when she has a voice again, you know, like it's a scary thing to feel like I could affect who's going to listen to our message because I sound funny. <laughs> and like most of you might hear this and go, she doesn't sound that bad. You know, that's because Jen's amazing at editing and <laughs> because I'm able to kind of slow down and talk more quietly. Mm -hmm. I'm not having to project because I am on a mic. <laughs> but so like there's ways that it can be easier, but it's still very difficult. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> a heavy, scary podcast. It is a heavy, scary podcast. Yeah. I think these are good for us sometimes. So going back to the whole relationship thing. So I've been with Beth for 22 years. I mean, my last name is basically and Beth <laughs> <laughs> because we're always Jen and Beth or Beth and Jen. And even going to Costa Rica because she's not going, that's kind of weird because I've never, I, like I've done work things without her, but I've never gone to a foreign country yeah. without her. Yeah. So even trying to navigate that a little bit because then I was like, well, you know, am I a bad wife if I go do this thing? Like I felt selfish and there were just some things to, things to work through. To work through. Yeah. Yeah. And she's like, go, go do it. Yeah. And I think nice. it can be good for you. You know, like, I think it can be good to like get out on your own and do your things that you like to do and make sure you're still living the life you enjoy. You know, like we don't have to have all of the same hobbies and all of that, you know, so. 
Well, and we're normally pretty good because she will double book us. And so I will go to one thing and she'll go to something else. And uh, she's also very relieved that I'm traveling with people I know, because I think she kind of uh, doubts my my skills to navigate the world by myself at times. <laughs> <laughs> so it might be more out of her fear than anything else. <laughs> that makes sense. I think it's good, too, though. You know, like, I mean, just having somebody, especially going to a foreign country, yeah. like, it's just nice. I was worried about Mish when she left for I was a little worried (laughs) yeah (laughs) so we're glad you made it back in one piece (laughs) yeah how was that going to a foreign country where you don't have an identity and making friends and it was hard I'm not even going to sugarcoat it I know so many people go to Europe and they have like a great time and I'm not going to say it was like overall it was a very good experience but like it was hard you know and I think and like maybe this is just because of my circumstances but um I think the expectation is, you know, you go there, you take some easy classes, you party, you travel a lot. I think that was my expectation too going in, but that's not really what happened. It ended up being like this whole like identity crisis thing and then like actually difficult classes and like super isolating, having nobody. Like my first half of the experience was like very lonely and I've experienced like loneliness before, but this was just different. And I I thought I was like prepared for it, but like I wasn't. And so I had to like, create something out of that. And it was like in this environment where I really, I know this is gonna sound corny, but like gratitude, I had like so much appreciation. Like I remember all the nights where I'd just be like, I'm gonna go home and I really am just gonna appreciate my teammates, the few friends I have, my family. And um, I really started to appreciate like more, more wholesome things that I didn't really have before. So like, I remember like just this one like very, very simple day I had. And it was probably like my most memorable day in Copenhagen. It was like so nice. We just like went to a museum, had dinner and watched the movie and like that was it. And that's like a very calm day for me. But like, I was so grateful for it, you know? And um, I don't know. It's just like this newfound appreciation for like simpler things I didn't have before. I think that's very nice. It's amazing what going around <laughs> the world will will do for you. <laughs> you know, what's funny is like, when they tell you to practice gratitude or have a gratitude journal or whatever, they're like, it can be simple things, you know, like I'm grateful I woke up this morning. I'm grateful I can see the sun. I'm grateful I can hear the birds. It can be very simple, but if you lost one of those things, that's no longer simple. Right. Right. So like when you recognize that you're missing the dinner with friends or just going to the movie or just hanging out or, you know, like, being able to talk, being able to sing. You know, I sing when I roll. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can't sing when I roll now. <laughs> or even just sing along to the, you know, radio or anything. So when those simple things that you're supposed to be grateful for, when you don't have them, you recognize why you are so grateful to have them. Yeah, I think gratitude is one of those things. Like you hear a lot about it, but then I think a lot of people just kind of brush over it and they're like, oh, I now, does it doesn't really make that big of a difference. I'm like, oh, I think it does. I just said that was kind of me. I definitely didn't realize what I had until I lost it. Most notably, as of recent, my knee. That's yeah. like really, really ruined me, kind of. You'll and figure I miss, it out. Yeah. I just missed the days when it was good, you know? Yeah, it's tough. It's. I mean, I went through that with my shoulder. Mm-hmm and then came back and it's all fine and good, but it, I missed it. I missed doing jujitsu. Yeah. It's weird how you can take your joints for granted. <laughs> it really is. Oh, my shoulder works like it's supposed to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My knee works like it's supposed to. It's wild. Do you think where we train defines us sometimes? Definitely. We- yes. From a lot of different aspects, you know, like maybe you are on a big team, you know, like let's take autos or something like those people, a lot of them bleed autos, you know? So I think that can be the way I think it can be the people you surround yourself with, Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, not that there's anything wrong with like a bro gym, but if you're training at a bro gym, then that's, you know, like the, the kind where everybody's taking their shirts off, like (laughs) there's a gym. I, I love these guys. But when I look at them, I'm like, you're you're never going to get women at that gym. <laughs> like n- no woman wants to train there. And you, they have like one. And it's like, OK, well, <laughs> she's an exception, not, you know, doesn't feel comfortable. Most people aren't going to feel comfortable. Most women, I guess, aren't going to feel comfortable there. So that kind of defines them. And 
the head instructor is like, I don't know how we got here, but this is where we are. <laughs> He's like, that's, you know, it's just who we've kind of accumulated. But it, it does. It, it defines their gym and defines the people there. If you train here, if you train at Real Model Grappling Academy, it does define you in a way that, like, I know that there aren't any, I'm trying to think of a word that you won't bleep. <laughs> <laughs> there aren't any jerk bags here because the, the head instructor is a female. Yeah. And so if you are a meathead that, with an ego problem, you probably come in and go, I'm not learning from a woman. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then go ahead. There's a yeah. door. You know, like, so it does define you in a way that, like, you are inclusive. Yeah. If you're not inclusive, you're not training here. And I'm not saying that there aren't tons of inclusive people that aren't training here. Absolutely right. there are. I'm just saying I know that if you're in these four walls, you're a good person. Yeah. Like for a lot of different reasons, not just that, but a lot of different reasons. Otherwise you don't last here. So there is definitely identity in where you train. Does doing gi or no gi define you? <laughs> I think people take identity in those things. Yes. Mm -hmm particularly no gi people more. I think most gi people train some no gi. Most no gi people do not train gi. So I think, I mean, like, I think that's just one of those things where it's like, yeah, this is my identity. I'm, I'm a no gi player. Or I'm a gi player, you know, like, but I'll do no gi if I have to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, that, that's the only option. I teach no gi once a week and uh, well, more than that, but you know, like, at least once a week. And I'm like, I hate no gi. <laughs> Every time I'm getting dressed, I'm like, God, I wish we were wearing geese. <laughs> <laughs> but I do it and I teach it because it's good for the gym. It's good for the students. Like we all need some no gi. Yeah, we do. But I definitely prefer gi strongly. <laughs> Same. I got a silly one. Oh, awesome. Okay. This is a silly one that people wrap up their identity in. But Jen, what kind of phone do you use? iPhone. Mish iPhone. <laughs> AJ. iPhone. <laughs> but you You're know, right. It Apple products specifically, I think people get very wrapped up in their identity. Like, you know, like I'm an iPhone user. Oh, you use an Android. Yeah. Let's grow up and get a real phone. You know, like I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that people get very wrapped up in that identity of what kind of electronics they use or what kind of gaming system they use. You know, oh, like Oh yeah. It's funny, like even just the silly things that we get so sports teams. Oh, yeah. Huge identity for people. Like what yeah. sport team they're rooting for. Go team. <laughs> I cannot name a single football player, basketball player, <laughs> anything. <laughs> I'm not sure I can name an active UFC fighter, though, but <laughs> I can, but not really. <laughs> I'm going to start naming old people like Rich Franklin or something. <laughs> So yeah, it's funny how much people's identity gets wrapped up in silly things too. They probably don't think it's silly. I'm sorry. I'm sure they don't think it's silly. <laughs> Just be mindful. It's yeah. like anything, balance, yeah. moderation, all the, you know, all the things. So let's wrap this up with an on and off the mat tip. What do you have? I didn't know what it was going to be when we started the podcast, but I think after you know, having me, Sean, and talking about it, I think it's really gratitude. I think it's being thankful for the little things, which are actually big things. Yeah. I think gratitude on and off the mat is the main tip I could have. Mish, you have one? I was just going to say, I, I think that sounds like really cliche, but like it turns out that some of the cliche sayings actually have some merit to them that you should, I don't know. I used to always like brush them off because I'd be like, oh, that's so like whatever. But now it's like, actually, it's real. So yeah, agreed. I think mine is if you're thinking about identity, because this is something that Beth was like, I never really thought about this until until you said something about it. But you know, that phrase that you're the, the sum of the five people that you spend the yes, most time with. Yes. And I think it's a really good time to look around and take inventory and who are these people? How are they impacting you? Are they living the life or, or working towards that life that you ultimately want, that you want to identify as? And if not, maybe it's time to clean house. 
Mm, I like cleaning house. <laughs> Not my actual house, but right. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> to like add to that too, are you doing the things that you identify as? If you identify as someone who eats healthy, but you're only eating junk, you know, like yeah. the, are the things you're doing adding to your identity or taking away from who you identify as? Well, I guess we'll see in a year when I go back and check all of the habits that I said I'm going to practice this year. Good, good. But I am, I am tracking them nice. like in my journal and paying attention to see if I am actually, because I think it's one thing to say, I want to be this person and do these things. But then when you go back and you've actually tracked it and you're like, did I? Yeah. So maybe I don't really want those things. And that's, that's okay. okay. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But like, is that who I really am? Does my identity match the person, my identity in my head match who everyone else identifies me as too? Like, oh. Are they one and the same? We've left y'all with a lot to ponder yeah. after this episode. <laughs> yeah, we have. <laughs> All right, friends, we're going to leave you with that. We would love to hear your thoughts about identity. So, you know, you can DM us. We are on Instagram at Beauty and the Gee Podcast, and I'm hanging out there at Brassy Broad Jen. And I'm AJ Klingerman, everywhere you go, unless I'm role model, which I'm that everywhere you go. Mish. And I'm Mish Kai with two H's. Okay, it's M-I-C-H-H-C-A-I, if you want to find me. All right. Thanks for tuning in, and we will see you on on the the mat. mat. Beauty and the Gee is a production of the Brassy Broadcasting Company. And brought to you by Role Model Grappling. 